Hi everyone, what happens when you mix 3 data structures, a splash of procedural geometry, and shaders that make things pulse and grow organically, and all of that in the browser? In this video, we'll break down a project I built in 3.js that does exactly that. The link is in the description, and by the end of this, you'll hopefully pick up a few things about creative graphics engineering. Welcome to yet another random coding exploration. Recently at work, I came across KD trees, a data structure widely used on algorithms to process 3D shapes. After some curiosity browsing, I realized that I never explored trees too much on personal explorations, and decided to get started on a fresh 3JS project. But before going further, let me quickly remind you what trees are. Trees on paper are very simple to understand, but can be used in weird and fascinating ways. Take a type that has some data in there, let's say a name, date of creation, label, whatever, add another line, call it children, and make it an array of that same type. By calling this a node and instantiating the children according to some algorithm, we obtain a tree data structure. This is, for example, exactly how a tree file explorer works. Now that we know how to represent a tree, let's look at how to play with one in 3D. I have this idea of a procedural growing 3D mesh structure that would start from the center of a sphere and spread its branch organically until a distance threshold is reached. By mixing in some fun shader techniques and procedural mesh generation, I should obtain something worthy of a post on Twitter after a few commits and some polishing. Seems like a good plan and looks like I have a few very interesting problems to resolve. Starting with the data tree generation algorithm. I create a tree node type containing a 3D vector for its position in 3D space, a weight float being the girth radius of the branch at the current node, and some other variables I'm going to come back to later. I start my tree with a root node at the center of my scene, and get a random number from 1 to 4 that will be my initial number of children. For each of these, I generate a position randomly with a sphere distribution around the root, instantiate a node, passing in that position data, and then push each of these into the children array of the root node. Now that I have some number of children to go off of, I can begin my breadth-first search algorithm that is going to repeat until a distance threshold is achieved. What's a breadth-first search algorithm? That might be a topic for a future video you definitely shouldn't miss. Just saying. Here is what happens for each cycle of that algorithm. For each node in the BFS queue, I take the direction vector from the root to that node and multiply it by a random scalar value. I create another random vector that is going to add noise to this vector, and if I just add that output to the position of my current node, I just found the position of my next child node. And I can repeat that process a random number of times to create multiple branches just like an actual tree. If a new computed position of a child goes above the distance threshold that I just check by taking the length from the root node to the newly generated child. I stop the algorithm here for that node. Otherwise, I just add the other children to the BFS queue to be handled in the next algorithm cycle. So far, this algorithm is only returning a tree of objects. It just is abstract TypeScript data. To visualize it, I'm writing a basic recursive function that creates a point for each node, and a simple 3D line connecting these points together. I now have somewhat of a beginning of a cool project with a cute yet complex procedural tree. It's obviously looking a little bit bland, and I am very far from what I want to obtain. How can I go from these flat lines to connected cylinders with dynamic radiuses? Well, that one, that one is interesting. I want to create a 3D mesh cylinder that will follow the natural direction of my tree and also want to control its thickness along the way. And since I want this as organic as possible, let's start by making these angles less a angly. That's a, that's a word. I come up with an algorithm that would decompose down the tree into a simpler to handle array of 3D segments. For each of those, I am using a centripetal catmull rom interpolation that takes in an array of 3D points and outputs a smooth 3D spline. The math for the interpolation of this is above the scope of this video, but goddamn, is it interesting. I then simply sample points along that curve to obtain a more organic segment. I end up with quite the same thing as I had before, but with more points and less angly angles. These points are the foundation around which I will build my 3D shape. But for that, I need to compute a few things first. For each point of each segment of my tree, I need to compute its tangent to the curve. For that, 
Super easy. I take the current point of a segment, look at the point before that, take the direction vector to the point after the current point, and that's how I compute the current tangent. And yes, I later realized 3JS curves already have a method to give you tangents, but we... we don't talk about that. With the tangent, I also need two other axes to create a local coordinate system. So I generate another random vector, cross product it to the tangent, normalize it, and now I have a normal. Take the cross product of these two, and I obtain the binormal. With a tangent, normal, in binormal, I now have a local coordinate system from which I can generate anything. And using the weights we computed during the tree generation, it's very simple to construct a circle with this variable as the radius, using some very basic trigonometry, and vector math with this new coordinate system. I do this for every single point on every single segment, and this is how I obtain every single vertices of this mesh I'd like to create. Okay, now I have a soup of 3D vertices, but I need to actually turn this into a geometry I can render properly. It's time to talk triangles. Now to me, this is a very exciting part. How am I possibly going to join all of these points to create a 3D mesh? Let's take these two adjacent circles I just computed. To make a cylinder out of this, since my GPU only understands triangles, I need to make a series of them to form my 3D shape. For that, I need two buffers. One containing the position of each point of that 3D object, which I already have, and one containing the indices to create the triangles of that said object. In other terms, to make it easier, let's say I have a buffer of positions that look like this, to form a square. In this case, my index buffer contains six consecutive numbers being indices of the position buffer to form two triangles, and so a square, also called a quad. And the order of indexing also is important as it dictates which direction that triangle is facing. You now understand index geometries in computer graphics. With that in mind, let's go back to these two circles. I take one point of the current circle, the next one of that same circle, and one of the opposite circle. That's a lot of circles. These are the indices of my first triangle. And now, if I do the opposite, two points of the second circle and the second one of the first circle, I now have the first quad of my cylinder. Going all around the two circles, my cylinder is done. I repeat that process for every point all the way through the segment and do that for every single segment. That's how I create the 3D geometry for the structure. Just to see it in action, I use a ready-made 3JS normal material, but obviously this wouldn't be a fun project without some head-to-desk bashing custom shaders, right? Right. I want to find a way to animate this object. For the moment, I have this dead form that just exists, but I want it more alive and overall, if possible, not look like trash. This is where I involve shaders. To make a long story short, shaders are programs passed to your GPU to handle loads of simple computing functions in parallel. A vertex shader processes the vertex position buffer to determine the position of each vertex on the screen, then the fragment shader runs per pixel to determine the final color of each pixel rasterized by the mesh. This is a fast sloppy summary, but shaders can get very complex. Even entire YouTube series and books are dedicated to them. When I first started, it took me months to wrap my head around even this one line. If you are interested in learning them though, which I encourage, please go read this right now. The Book of Shaders. I promise you it unlocks so much. That, that was a tangent. Anyways, for the current matter at hand, here is the bird's eye view idea of my shader. If I insert a plain output color in the fragment shader, let's say red, it's easy to see that I will be lacking loads of details on my structure. Instead, let's go back up a few layers in the pipeline in the vertex shader. First, I compute the normals of my vertices to camera space and pass it to the fragment shader as a varying alongside my camera's view vector. If I take the dot product of these two vectors, I have a very simple way to color the mesh's edge according to the camera's position relative to the triangle's orientation. That's your basic Fresnel shading. If I add to that a slicker dark background, this is already getting a little bit nicer to look at, but I'd like my 3D object to seemingly grow from the origin all the way down the extremities of my tree. Extremities extremities. A very easy and fast way would have been to get the distance of each vertex to the world origin and use this in the shader, but this would completely bypass the complexity of some curves and get totally broken if I decide to extend on this project in the future. Instead, let's go back to these variables in my tree node. The branch size is a variable used to compute the size of the segment I am currently evolving on. From there, by traversing my tree and using backpropagation, I am able to compute the depth. 
It's a normalized value from 0 to 1, representing how far down the tree a vertex is, with 0 being at the root and 1 at the furthest tips. I then pass this as a custom shader attribute, and now that I have this information, I can do a bunch of very fun things. Let's take a trigonometric function like cosine. With only three parameters, I can change its phase, frequency, and amplitude. If I clamp the angle from 0 to pi, then I get this ramp that smoothly transitions from 0 to 1. There is a thousand ways to do this in GLSL, I just enjoy that one. Smooth step enjoyers, please... Uh, please let me be. And by creating a progress variable, I can dictate where this ascension begins. I take this factor variable and multiply it as a scalar to the normal of the current vertex. I can now control how far a current two point is from the current segment center. And if I plug in the depth attribute I computed earlier as a phase offset, that's how I can easily control how the mesh unravels. Then in the fragment shader, I pass in that same growth factor plug it into the alpha channel, and just don't show any pixels beyond a certain threshold. And there you go, a procedural growing mesh. And lastly, once again, to add a little bit more life to the scene, in the same normal displacement fashion, I took another wave function, this time a sine one, and changed a few of its parameters to have these smooth bumps as the angle progresses. If I use a U time uniform, just a value that takes the time elapsed between every frame, and passing once again the depth as an offset, I have a pulse animation on the vertices that I can then simply pipe to the fragment shader and play with changing colors. Now, that's a coding exploration. So there you have it. From a data structure on paper to a pulsing, organic 3D creature rendered in your browser. I started this project with curiosity about trees and ended up with a creative sandbox for graphics experimentation. There is still a lot to polish and expand on as every single project ever. Add some mouse interactivity there, maybe integrate it with a UI for a sick portfolio, who knows. If you enjoyed this breakdown or learned something new, drop a like, share it around, or let me know in the comments what you'd like to see me do next. That is all for me, and I see you all very soon on the internet. Bye bye everyone.